It is so great to be here. Thank y'all very much. How about Eric Erickson, y'all? Oh. Now, let me get into the dynamics of 2018 because I've talked to so many candidates, the statewide candidates, uh, people who are running and even some of the state representative seats, and it is striking to me that the candidates who were in those suburban areas in Cobb and Gwinnett where the Republicans promised to pay for a ground game and they never delivered it, um, it, it wasn't just you. It, it was, um, let's see, Sam Teasley yep. ran into this. Um, um, Fran Miller. Yeah, Fran Miller. Betty Price. Betty Price. Alex Kaufman. And, and, yeah. and Rob Woodall, bear, I mean, came within just a couple yeah, hundred Matt. votes. Yeah. Uh, and there was a ground game where the historically black college student union put people in for six months for Stacey Abrams on the ground. The Republicans weren't even in there in the last week. Uh, the Kemp campaign was spending their resources outside of the Atlanta area to win, and we paid a price for it. And I think it's a price that we can now spend some resources and get all those seats back, including yours. Yep. I think absolutely we're going to get this seat back in 2020. Um, in regards to 18, let me just make something abundantly clear. Having a Governor Abrams was a non-starter. So if we had to have a little pause to get Brian Kemp elected, that's fine. Now it was a wake-up call. We are redoubling our efforts. I can tell you that the Trump victory team, they are here already getting to work. We've got great volunteers in this room. Betsy Kramer is a rock star. We, how many are my six district people? How organized are we going to be in the 6th District for 2020? We know what's at stake, and I'm here to tell you, old Rocky Top McBath, we're going to send her right on back to Tennessee. I'm glad you raised this issue because it, it's striking to me how the media, and for those of you who outside of Georgia, we got a lot of you here who aren't from Georgia, neither is the congresswoman from the 6th yeah. Congressional District. Uh, her family, her husband, they all live in Tennessee. And the local media here in Atlanta stunningly uh, worked very hard to downplay the story of the fact that she, I mean, even her Cobb County what um, homestead exemption right. was revoked. In uh, February of this year, after an audit and an appeals by the McBath, the homestead exemption in East Cobb in the 6th District for the McBath family was revoked. Why? Because she and her husband failed to meet the residency requirements to have a homestead exemption. Their cars are registered in Tennessee. What I'd like to see, where has Lucy McBath been filing her income taxes for the past decade? Hey, yeah. I mean, if the president's supposed to disclose That's his, right. yeah. Um, so basically what you're saying is we need to, well, do to her like Georgia does to the Tennessee football team and just beat. Them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right on. Now, to be fair, little league teams beat the Tennessee football team. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I say that because Philip, who works with me, big Tennessee football fan, he's continually disappointed. Now, let's talk about some issues here. Let's talk about issues. You were also Secretary of State in Georgia, and you began the process of cleaning up voter rolls that had been left just unwieldy Secretary of State's office that didn't clean them up despite legislative requirements. And it, it, it had to be stunning to you in 2018 to hear all of the, the wailing and gnashing of teeth from Democrats uh, that suddenly laws Democrats wrote but never enforced were being enforced. That was stunning. And in fact, the, the first uh, conference that I did with you mm -hmm. was when I was Secretary of State, and that was a really big issue. What is so important about the voter rolls is if they are not current and up to date, one, you can't control and see who is voting, number one. And if an invalid vote comes in, what does that do? It invalidates the vote of someone who's legally allowed to vote. Um, we're fortunate in Georgia that and we have photo ID, which I was able to implement as Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But, and I will tell you that we can debate how long early voting should be, but in-person early voting with photo ID, that is the most secure 
way to have the highest degree of integrity in our elections. We as, as a party, um, Secretary Raffensperger is on top of this around um, absentee ballots by mail. I fear that is the new wild, wild west and that has got to um, have some additional checks and balances in it. But for Abrams to just cry, she just refused to accept the fact that she lost. And I get how much money was spent in her race, I get how much maybe she wanted to win, but at the end of the day, Brian Kemp won that election, he won it fairly, and thank goodness he did, he is now Governor Brian Kemp, and aren't we all happy for that? Amen. When you're talking to people in the sixth, what is the issue that is really resonating with them right now? Uh, I, I know there's polling out there that Republicans have conducted, but now some independent Pew polling shows that the voters in that district are really opposed to the idea of impeaching the president. Yes. Yes. And, and I see that your opponent, Congresswoman, is, is starting to, she had been saying no, no, and now she's starting to say, uh, yeah, maybe we should impeach him. Uh, and I realize that's an obvious issue, but what out there really is firing up people in that district? So a couple of things. One, the impeachment issue. 60% um, of voters in the 6th District do not support impeaching the president. And that number went up after Mueller testified in judiciary. Why? Because it was abundantly clear that there was no collusion and there was no other action upon which to move forward with. And people in the district want Congress and the Democrats to move on and start dealing with the issues that are affecting every single one of you day in and day out. We don't want the craziness. People are fired up about, really, it's craziness coming out of the mouths of these Democrat presidential candidates. They want to make private insurance illegal. Illegal. And I'm here to tell you, Lucy McBath has already, or Rocky Top McBath, has already <laughs> weighed in for Kamala Harris. She made it clear. How many of you in this room have private insurance? Exactly. And that is going to fire up voters big time around that when especially suburban moms start to really understand what that means and how that affects their world day in and day out. There's also a... a some of the things that she's voted for, that the Democrats have put in, and I mean, maybe she's trying to be charitable, maybe I shouldn't be, freshman member of Congress, maybe not understanding that the Democrats have put other provisions in some of the legislation she's voted for that would completely undermine the president's tax reform bill, yes. would hurt small businesses in the district. Uh, it, it really does matter having someone in there paying attention to the small details, and, and I'm not sure that she and her, her team either, they, do, they don't pay attention to it, which is a problem, or they do and they don't care that some of the things she's been voting for would just absolutely hurt the small businesses in that area. Well, one of the things that's most disturbing about Rocky Top McBath is that she tells the voters here in the 6th District one thing and does something entirely different in Washington, D.C. Let's start with gun control. She told everyone that she wanted, quote, common sense gun control. Yet, a few weeks ago, she held a press conference and called on America to be a gun-free society. She told the people of the 6th District that she would not support an increase in the minimum wage because it would, quote, crush the small businesses in her district. She promptly went to Washington and voted on doubling the minimum wage, which is going to hurt our small businesses, especially retail and franchisees, etc. So she is making bad policy and supporting bad policy that does not align with the best interests of the people of the 6th District. On top of that, she is missing in action. It took her almost three months to set up her constituent services office. Three months. That's ridiculous. I came in and the phones are being answered the first week. It is not that hard to set up an office. So we are gonna have to work as hard as we possibly can coming into this so that we can get serious, competent leadership back for the people of the 6th District. Well, in that regard, I know a number of the people in the 6th Congressional District, one of the, the big issues that they deal with on a regular basis is transportation funding because of all the development that's going on, and a lot of it is necessarily dependent on federal highway dollars. Whether we like it or not as conservatives, 
uh, some of the roads there have to are required to have federal funding. And it, it seems like that she hasn't been able to, willing to, or, or really understand the necessity of that. Now, I, as, a, as a small government conservative, let me just say, I would prefer it if the federal government got out of, the, out of dealing with highways and bridges and let the states do it through block grants, but that's not the world we live in. And it seems like she doesn't live in the world we live in either when it comes to infrastructure and the needs of, of development in that area. Well, how can she when she's in Tennessee? True. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the infrastructure issues are important, and really the constituent services piece of being a member of Congress um, is, yes, the votes are important. You want to have a congressman who votes in a way that aligns well with the views and the values of the district and our state, but you also need to have a member of Congress who understands that working closely with our local governments is absolutely paramount. Um, she does not uh, interact frequently with the local government, well, except for one in Brookhaven. Um, but it is, that is really important. And when it comes to the grant, so no member of Congress can, quote, request money for um, a local government. Um, but what we do have an obligation to do is sort of have the back and be a partner of all the cities and East Cobb and uh, DeKalb across uh, the 6th District. And that takes constant communication and understanding what the issues are. And I was really proud. I can't, I'm not going to take full credit for it. I was really Rob Woodall's wing woman <laughs> for getting a large grant for Georgia 400. It was about $200 million, one of the largest uh, transportation grants ever to come to the state of Georgia to help with some of the um, uh, work there. Um, but that's, you're really right, that is a big part of the job. Now, I, I don't want to dwell on, on her because this is a conference in Georgia and we'll have the governor of Tennessee here to talk about Tennessee and we should leave it to, <laughs> leave it to the governor of, of Tennessee and, and not talk about his constituents. Um, <laughs> But just, I, I just do want to say that for a while, I was going up every Sunday and was doing some hits on MSNBC in the evening. Several of the producers were friends of mine a long time. Like, sure, you need a conservative to come on. And I was just always struck that every single week I was up there, she was on MSNBC. And it's like, I know the, the viewership in the 6th Congressional District for MSNBC. There may be five viewers. It's, it's striking to me that she spends that much time on that network. Well, I, I think there's something that I've observed with um, any number of uh, the newly elected Democrats is that they are extremely interested in national celebrity. And being a member of Congress, it's not about going around the country and being on MSNBC all the time and trying to build your national celebrity credibility. It's not about a single issue, and it's certainly not about special interests. It's about being an extension of the people in your district every single day. And I'm not sure that uh, for many of the Democrats in particular, they don't understand that. And the agenda that's being pushed is so out of alignment, not just for the 6th District in the state of Georgia, but it is out of alignment for America. And that is why winning in the 6th, winning in the 7th is so important because that is, those two districts, they are crucial, crucial to making sure that President Donald Trump carries Georgia and that we reelect David Perdue. It's crucial, and we'll be relying on you to build that ground game. While I was sitting here and you were talking, I just thought, I, I bet the reason she's on MSNBC all the time is that there are a lot of viewers in Knoxville, Tennessee, <laughs> the professors at <laughs> University of Tennessee who watch that. So, I mean, maybe she's doing constituent outreach for, for liberal college professors in Tennessee. Now, let, let's move on from, from one of Governor Lee's constituents and, and actually move into Georgia and, and the politics here. Uh, there are a lot of issues out there in addition to helping the president and David Perdue in 2020. Uh, some of them are organizational, some of them policy-wise. Uh, having voters and having support in Congress to push some of the policies, for example, disaster relief in South Georgia, that though the 6th District is outside of that, certainly is impacted by that, but also some of the funds for education in the state and education policy in the federal government. 
That's right, and I have to give a, a shout out to Congressman Austin Scott, who really, for the disaster relief funds in South Georgia, he was such a champion on that. Um, and I have always viewed my job as a member of Congress that, yes, I represent the six, but I'm also part of the broader Georgia team um, and making sure that I am working with Austin if it is a military base issue or it's an ag issue um, and all of those things that we work as a team. And one thing I want all of you to know is that the Georgia delegation among the Republicans, it is a really close-knit delegation and we worked so incredibly well together and that's a huge benefit to, to the people of not just a particular congressional district but for the state as well. Well, you mentioned the military. When we went into the minority, we lost one member of the Armed Services Commission or Armed Services Committee, uh, and there continues to be rumors of a BRAC coming around, particularly as we're dealing with uh, financial issues and, and looking at the military. Uh, there is a military presence uh, up there. Uh, if you wouldn't mind talking just a little bit about your experience in dealing with those sorts of issues when you were in Congress and. Yeah. No. So um, everyone, if you're not familiar with BRAC, that's when there's a realignment of uh, base infrastructure across the United States and around the world. And you know, I will say that uh, Senator Chambliss previously was the big lead there. Now we have Senator Perdue and Senator Isaacson, who uh, together with Congressman Heiss and, and Congressman Austin Scott really take the lead on that issue. But all of the bases, not just a base in Austin Scott's district or um, uh, Dobbins, all of them are important because they're linked. Um, and we worked so closely together, and should another BRAC come around, it will require um, all hands on deck from a delegation, but importantly, it will also lean on relationships that members of the Georgia delegation have with other members of Congress who also have a big footprint from a military standpoint. And that's where we also have real strength, um, particularly with um, Austin Scott and with uh, David Perdue and Johnny Isaacson. Um, and so there's a lot of, of when we're, I'll take the immigration bill, for example, that came through judiciary, which is just a, a extremely tough committee, just issues wise. But I actually loved it because it had these types of issues. Um, and we worked on the immigration bill that had $75 billion in funding, advanced funding for the border wall. It had um, federal E-Verify. It had a guest worker program for the ag community, et cetera. And some of the pushback was, ooh, that could be amnesty. But I would submit doing nothing is de facto amnesty. And so we different um, across the spectrum of the Republican Party, we all work together to have a bill to bring to the floor. Um, we weren't able to quite get it across the finish line, but that's an example of how um, from every aspect of the Republican Party, we do work together on these different policy issues to get it the best that we possibly can to get to 218, because that's what you have to have to pass a bill in the House, 218. In that regard, uh, I thought it was very notable that a third of Republicans in the House refused to vote for this past budget deal. Yeah. And I understand. Here's why. So when Republicans had the majority, there was a plan around moving to dealing with the fiscal house of the United States of America, and it has got to be dealt with. Step one was getting our economy moving again. Because dealing with the budget when you're growing at one, one and a half percent is a whole different ball game than if you're growing at three, three and a half percent. So number one, get the budget go, get the economy going again. We did that with the tax cuts. Number two, our military had been absolutely just de diminished because of cuts from the Democrats. And we had an obligation 
for the safety of the United States of America, for our obligation to our men and women who we ask them to do a job for us, to rebuild the military so that they have the funding they need to do to do the job we're asking them to do. Step three was then moving to reform the budget process. Doug Collins uh, headed up a task force. I had the privilege of serving with him on that task force, and we had laid out a roadmap to begin doing that with a balanced budget amendment. Um, moving to a required two-year budget. Uh, no budget, no pay for Congress, because that's one of the most important things that we do. Do your job. Do your job. Unfortunately, we lost a majority last year, so that has had a little bit of a, of a stop, obviously. But coming back, if I have the privilege of serving the people of the 6th District again, that is going to be priority number one, keeping the economy going, making sure we maintain the resources for the military, and fix the fiscal house of this nation. One of the issues that has continually come up, whether it's uh, Senator Cotton, Senator Perdue, Senator Scott, Congressman Roy, Heist Meadows, everyone keeps mentioning entitlement reform. Mm. And that unless we come up with a way to restructure that, we're going to continue to run into problems. Absolutely. I mean, is there any level of consensus at all to, to be able to advance on that issue with the Republicans? I wouldn't say the consensus is there yet, but I would say that the desire to achieve consensus on where to go is there. Um, there is a strong understanding that we cannot continue to kick the can down the road, which was why we had this task force um, looking at um, every aspect of the budget. And we had entitlements on, on the table as well. And just to clarify, I don't really consider Social Security a traditional as we would typically define entitlements. Um, I think we really have to look strongly at more block grants to the state. They are more cost effective. States can manage the money in a much more cost effective way than top down from the federal government. So the tools are there. We just have to get one, get the majority back because the Democrats are not going to tackle this issue. They don't care how dire the financial issues are and, and how steep the debt gets. But once Republicans are back, we've got to put um, a very concerted effort and make it a priority. Now, before we get out of here, let people know where they can find out more about your campaign. Uh, KarenHandle.com, and I would venture to guess that about half of you have my cell phone number in here, so just call. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm not going to leave the stage without saying an extraordinarily heartfelt thank you to so many of you in this room who have lifted me in your prayers. You have come from other states to help me. Um, you have supported me. Um, I appreciate everything that you've done for me. And I know, Eric, I don't own this seat. It is my job to earn the vote. And I'm going to work so, so hard to do that so that we can get the 6th District back into competent hands and get on the road to keeping the majority, re-electing our president, re-electing David Perdue. Thank you all. God bless. <laughs>